SC disconnect enable on. Copy that, Houston. Sealed in isolation in a tiny capsule millions of kilometers from home, the first manned mission to Mars will be the greatest test of human mind, body, and spirit. The longer the mission, the harder the strain is on the human being, the greater the risk. The last time a human being went to deep space was 1972. Six people will be trapped like rats for two and a half years with no chance of escape. Imagine that you are trapped with those people in one of the small offices where you work. Would you want to be in a room with those people for years? A thousand days of smelling each other's sweat, drinking each other's urine, with no privacy and nothing to do. How are you going to keep yourself entertained? How are you going to keep yourself focused? The most challenging part of the mission will be to prevent the crew from killing themselves or each other. If anything goes wrong, there'll be no rescue mission. The astronauts are alone, and they know it. The fear of death will be constant for 1,000 days. The astronauts are under no illusion. They're in a risky business. Mental breakdown, sexual tension, near suicide, mutiny. These are not what ifs. It's all really happened on missions in space. Psychologists around the globe agree the first crucial step to a successful mission to Mars is to select a new kind of astronaut. If we make a mistake in crew selection, then conflicts might arise on board. These conflicts can kill the crew, just like a disease. Our exploration of other worlds begins inside the human mind, seeking ways to identify and control the torment of isolation, deprivation, and loneliness. Work has already begun to solve the Achilles heel of the Mars mission. The human factor. from ABC News. The Apollo 13 spacecraft has had a serious power supply malfunction that could cause the lunar landing mission to be terminated early. April 1970. Uh, Houston, we've had a problem. Two days after launch, uh, Apollo 13 is crippled by an explosion. We had a pretty large bank associated with the uh, caution and warning there. Oxygen and heating systems are knocked out. Negative flames. Believe the crew reported it. An engineering team in mission control remains in constant contact with the astronauts, overcoming problem after problem to bring three men home alive. The odds against success cannot be calculated. Let's solve the problem, but let's not make it any worse by guessing. Okay, well, let's make sure we don't blow the whole mission. Six days after launch, human ingenuity triumphs over the menace of space. And welcome home. Thank you. Odyssey Houston, we show you on the main. It really looks great. This heroic, famous story will not be repeated on the Mars mission. The time delay with mission control is up to 23 minutes. Given the distance traveled through space, there will be no real-time feedback from mission control. The crew will have to sort out problems on their own. You're going away from the Earth with no chances of coming back until the two planets align back. They're not on the same orbit. The consideration of being very isolated, um, going to a world where no one has gone before but with no possibility to turn back physically until a precise time uh, is going to be completely new. Plus the trip to Mars is going to be a little boring. So what do you have? You have people floating through an endless, velvety black void with nothing in sight. The journey to and from the surface of the red planet back to Earth will be a year of boredom. It's a power spike from the MTLs. This can't be good. Then there's the constant pressure that something could go wrong. Jerry Lineger, an American astronaut, 
who spent 132 days in space, was aboard the Russian station Mir for the worst fire in the history of manned orbit. A ruptured oxygen device set panels and instruments alight, and toxic smoke filled the station. There was no window to open, no fire escape. For 90 seconds, the crew fought the blaze, knowing failure meant certain death. The master alarm went off course, the smoke uh, filled the station, and it, it was uh, readily apparent that there was indeed a fire. Being a physician, I was very concerned with uh, crew health. We set up, the blaze uh, subsided, but it was a close call. Might take place. From my assessment, I don't see where anyone had any serious inhalation damage. It's a dire omen for those daring enough to attempt the voyage to Mars. If you will, death is a part of the business. It's an occupational hazard. So what kind of astronaut should be selected for the mission to Mars? In the beginning of the space age, NASA decided to pick astronauts from the ranks of military test pilots. In the 1960s, test pilots were dying at the rate of one a week. They had gotten used to the idea of death on the job. Call it bravery, call it an addiction to danger, these young men were exactly what NASA needed. Seven. We have a go for maintenance start. Four, three, two, one. Booster ignition and liftoff. All that changed with the shuttle program. Military daredevils still commanded, but scientists and school teachers now orbited the Earth. Since 1980, the qualifications at NASA were about physical fitness and specific mission skills. An expedition to Mars is a whole other ballgame. I would say that traditional, you know, uh, lone pilot facing the odds is just not going to do really well on a mission to Mars. Pat Santee worked as a psychiatrist and flight surgeon for NASA in the 1980s. The same way that engineers pay attention to even the smallest screw in a spacecraft structure, we need to pay attention to how human personality is organized, how the human psyche is structured, and how that psyche is going to interact with other human psyches. Canadian Dave Williams is a NASA astronaut. He's helping the agency find the Mars generation of space traveler. It's very interesting that when you look at astronauts and cosmonauts worldwide, these are individuals who love flying. They love mechanical devices. They love working on computers, working on their cars. They're really into the new technology. Well, right now, we're looking for the next generation of astronauts. We're calling these people exploration astronauts. And I think these folks are going to have to have a number of what we call generic skills. The capability of repairing a rover, for instance, repairing a spacesuit, maintaining a spacesuit, troubleshooting or rebuilding a computer. You do need a Mr. Fix-It man. You need the right tools. You need human ingenuity. You know, you better take some duct tape along with you, you, you know, because you cannot call back and say, hey, I need a part. These are the first humans to embark on the most incredible and dangerous voyage into the darkest reaches of space. These two young Russian men could be our first ambassadors to Mars. In any case, this will rank with the first flight to space and the flight to the moon. Well, it does not matter which country is the first one. The most important thing is that humanity broke through and made such a big step, that we proved that we're capable of flying not just around Earth, but also travel in space, a long way from the boundaries of Earth and visit other planets. The Russians are putting their faith in their genes. They are part of a cosmonaut dynasty. Their fathers were very famous cosmonauts who in their time undertook very memorable and challenging space missions. Whatever method is used to select the crew to go to Mars, space agencies across the world no, these astronauts will need to be psychologically stronger than any other before them. In Russia, the selection process is not so much about skill as it is about stamina. Valery Polyakov holds the world record 438 days in orbit. Now he's leading Russia's search team. 
I believe that the extreme conditions of this flight, especially the time in a closed spaceship, means that we're looking for very special human qualities. These will not be ordinary people. They must all get along under the most difficult conditions. The Russian Mars program conducts rigorous isolation testing. Roman Romanenko is being put through his paces, isolated, forced to stay awake for up to three days, and subjected to an endless battery of meaningless tasks. It's a controlled version of the mindless routine of the voyage to Mars. If Romanenko cracks under the pressure, his dreams of going to Mars will be over. We need to study thoroughly the qualities of the astronaut's character. To do so, we must violate the major laws of life and mind. For example, the regime of non-stop activities could last for 64 or 72 hours. The Russians have decades of experience with long-term missions in space. Through trial and error, Russia built the Mir space station, giving cosmonauts and astronauts a chance to stay in Earth orbit for months at a stretch. Jerry Lininger thought he was mentally tough until his mission on Mir. I was actually shocked of my time on Mir, of how isolated and how cut off and stuck with myself that I felt during that time, and also of how vulnerable I was. And I saw in my crewmates some uh, pretty serious psychological problems developing, people kind of going off the cliff and not able to function at the level I'm sure they wanted to function at. For the new breed of astronaut, everyday life in the confined quarters of the Mars spaceship could turn into a modern day torture chamber. Science fiction makes space travel look easy. This is more like the harsh reality the Mars astronauts will have to cope with. I'm into the node. This way I see another treadmill, the bathroom, the toilets, things like that. Life on board is a living hell, crowded, noisy, and dirty. Jerry Lininger spent five months on the Russian space station. He paints a pretty grim picture of life in close quarters. There are no showers in space. Slightly different area, but this is where we do our, the other two cosmonauts did their cleaning up. Little mirror here, of course. Even in best case scenario, you might end up with a little towelette with a little three or four drops of water on it. You exercise in space to try to keep your body strong. You get hot just like you do on Earth, and your shower consists of that. We would, uh, float by each other throughout the day and you'd sort of fly high and another guy fly low because you don't want to get too close to a guy that hasn't showered in five months. There's worse to come. Water is mass and engineers on Earth must keep it to a minimum. And the toilet itself is over this way and it's a very simple design and Mike wants to... Which means the astronauts must purify and drink their own urine on the long voyage to Mars. Something about drinking your own urine is, you know, there's just something that doesn't sound so good about that. You, you convert that urine, they tell you it's pure, it's good stuff, it's now water, but there's still something that tells you you just don't want to drink that stuff. I finally got to the point, I said, you know, to be an astronaut, I can drink my urine, but I cannot drink my crewmate's urine. And that's about it for the toilet. You know, sleeping bag sitting right here. This just happens to be the commander's sleep station. Smells and drinking your urine are just irritations compared with the real hardships of sleep deprivation. Sleep is critical no matter where humans go, and if they don't get it, performance deteriorates very rapidly. There's no up or down in space. Astronauts strap themselves into sleeping bags held down by Velcro. Noise levels within Mir and the International Space Station were at times intolerable. The Mars mission depends on a quieter craft. When people stay awake more than 18 hours, they tend to have psychomotor impairments equivalent to when they are inebriated or, or drunk, at least by legal uh, blood alcohol limits. Deprived of sleep, the risk of accidents on the Mars mission will be high. Astronauts have been telling scientists for decades that they sleep less in space. The problem is 
No one can work it out. It could be workload. It could be noise level. Uh, it may be the disruption of circadian clocks in spaceflight. All of those things are known to do that. So that we're still not entirely sure all the reasons sleep is altered in spaceflight. You take your, uh, your canned food, for example. Just Jerry Lineger warns of another important human need. Food cravings obsessed him the entire time on the Mir space station. Ten minutes to eat up a, a good-sized uh, can of tuna. I would have killed for a glass of milk, uh, a bag of pretzels. I would have just killed for anything different. Now, there's not even hot water to reheat this thing. Eating mush is bad. Cold mush, intolerable. Unlike Mir and the ISS, there will be no resupply ship for the Mars crew. They will be taking all their food with them, the equivalent of 450 refrigerators worth. NASA takes Lineger's complaint seriously and is looking for solutions for the Mars mission. Everything points to the fact that food not only provides that nutritional effect, but also the psychological well-being. Experts at NASA's food lab are cooking up the Mars menu. What's the first thing we all complain about when we go to school? The food. Now, the cafeteria food is never good. So we need to make sure that we have the highest acceptability food system available since this is all they're going to have. So we are trying to provide to the crew a variety of foods so that they will find enough foods that will make them happy in what they want. What foods the astronauts don't bring, they will grow. Experiments conducted on the space shuttle show that fresh vegetables are not just good for the body, they're good for the spirit. At the University of Guelph in Canada, low pressure chambers replicate a spacecraft environment to grow vegetables. 282. Anyone can operate for two weeks on freeze dried camping foods. But if you're looking for a period of months of living, of transit, providing those fresh food and supplements to the diet will, will have a, a beneficial psychological and social effect of that connection with your, your diet. I can tell you when a resupply ship came up, they always stuffed a few oranges and lemons in the front of that resupply ship. You know, we were just all gathering the lemons and just, you know, sniffing them and oh my God, the, 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 uh, the smells of the earth. Food, sleep, hygiene. These basic human needs will be a luxury on the Mars voyage. But living together for so long, might be the most difficult challenge to solve. On a voyage to Mars, rebellion is a real possibility. Even contact with mission control can become a source of tension. Hey guys, sorry about the longer than normal delay, but uh, believe me, we haven't been idle down here. When you go into isolation and confinement, your world now narrows down into this little tiny space. And you are now completely dependent for communications, resources, logistics on mission control. We're still baffled by all of this as much as you are. This creates a, a tremendously complex dynamic where you need these people, but you feel that they don't understand you. Altitude 4.3 nautical miles downrange to... It happened in 1973 on NASA Skylab. Too many orders from the ground, and the crew went on strike. It was a serious breakdown of command and control. A similar strike happened on the Russian Mir station in the 80s. That's a whole other aspect of interpersonal skills. There's the us versus them quality of the people in space versus the people at home. These missions were measured in just weeks, not the years of a Mars Odyssey. To avoid these problems, the Mars astronaut will need communication skills as much as technical ones. The medical and psychological characteristics of the astronauts will play a crucial role in the selection of the crew. Canadians Dave Williams and Chris Hadfield both became astronauts in 1992. Hadfield has been on both Mir and the International Space Station. He has the sort of hands-on experience that can help Williams find a crew for Mars. 
it's going to be interesting to see what we decide is the right mix of both skills and people to go. Yeah. Because, you know, do we need one doctor, four doctors, no doctors? Do we need one test pilot, four, none? Do we want it to be all men, all women? NASA's thinking of a crew of six, maybe seven people. There will be both men and women aboard, which raises a new question. What happens if astronauts mix business with pleasure? Are you holding up? I'm holding up. A NASA shuttle astronaut is in a Florida jail this morning, charged in a kidnapping plot. Authorities say... In 2007, space shuttle astronaut Lisa Nowak was dismissed from NASA after being charged with attempted kidnapping. Her target was a female Air Force officer who was competing for the affections of another astronaut. Top NASA official says Lisa Nowak showed no signs of instability before her arrest this week. But now the agency's taking a look at itself. Seeing if it might the press descended on NASA with questions about psychological testing. More extensive psychological examinations are required for long duration flights. Astronauts also undergo extensive medical examinations when they return from space. NOAC's case unveiled NASA's position on sex among astronauts. It's okay, as long as it doesn't get in the way of the mission. We treat astronauts as we do other federal employees within the federal government, but uh, we do not meddle into the private lives of astronauts or other employees within NASA. It happens everywhere on Earth. It'll happen on the way to Mars, and just stop worrying about it. Just let people who have the right skill set right across the board go, and, and the other problems will take care of themselves. As to the sex it's him itself, there's no problem. I talked with uh, Kandakova, a third Russian woman in space, and her reply to this question was absolutely perfect. She said, all depends with whom. To give you an example, when I flew to the space station, Valerie Polyakov had already been there for nine months. An all-male company, and then suddenly a woman appeared. As Valerie told me, Yelena, now that you're here, I even have to shave every day. On the other hand, we're better behaved now, we swear less, and take better care of our parents. So I'd say, indeed, women would play an important role in long-duration space travel to Mars. The Russians aren't so sure that liberal sexual values suit a Mars mission. In 1999, they conducted a 240-day isolation experiment. The subjects were would-be astronauts, all male, except one woman from Canada, Judith Lapierre. A few weeks into the four-month experiment at a New Year's party, the Russian commander French kissed Lapierre. The kiss caused an international incident. If this represents reality in space, I think we have a problem and we have to work on some of those issues to solve it before we're really in space. She accused him of sexual harassment. The commander said she failed to understand Russian customs. Judith truly, truly felt she had been violated. And when talking to the Russian, he truly didn't even understand why a big deal was made of this. I do believe the kiss, sexuality, uh, this whole area had uh, elements of cultural differences. Lapierre stuck it out for the remainder of the experiment with a lock on her compartment door. The Russians now say that no women will be selected for their Mars mission. I think it is not a good idea to have a mixed crew, men and women, on board the flight to Mars. I have flown with Ilana Kondakova. She performed extremely well as a human being, as a professional. But on a flight as long as a flight to Mars, the presence of a woman might cause psychological problems and tensions. Antarctica is Earth's best analogy for a Mars mission. Earlier in the 20th century, women frequently accompanied men on the voyages to the poles. Sex was considered a healthy part of expedition life. 
in many polar expeditions there have, has long been a tradition ever since women have been spending the winter in the uh, Antarctic uh, of what are euphemistically called bachelor marriages. These are generally short-term relationships that last during the time on the expedition itself and then generally dissolve when the expedition ends. In 1915, Ernest Shackleton's expedition came to a halt when his ship became trapped in the ice. 28 men were now fighting for their lives, knowing that no one would rescue them. Survival depended on their teamwork and Shackleton's leadership. Shackleton made very wise decisions in the selection of his crew. He could uh, assign the right tasks to the right people, and I think we've learned a lot uh, about what a mission to Mars is going to be like based on the experience that we've had in polar environments. Antarctic temperatures plummet to minus 35 degrees. Flesh will freeze in seconds. Even today, rescue is all but impossible until spring. Like Mars astronauts, crews live in close quarters. Isolation and confinement can bring out strong emotions, even violence. There was one famous case about a half dozen years ago in which a member of the cooking staff took a claw hammer and assaulted a couple of his fellow crew members. There's always the possibility that conflicts can escalate to life-threatening situations where someone may assault uh, another crew member and that those situations have to be recognized well in advance and dealt with some way. Successful polar workers are self-motivated and resourceful. These exploration skills are exactly what Dave Williams is looking for. If your whole food supply has been destroyed by some catastrophe, uh, getting upset about it doesn't help the situation. So there are personality types of people who are very successful explorers. Who are the six men and women who can get along in a cramped space the size of a small apartment for years? Even if NASA and the Russians find solutions, there is no easy fix that can combat the human factor. So scientists are developing an early warning system to try to stop any conflict escalating to a point where it could threaten the mission and the crew. The journey to Mars will be the longest manned voyage in history. Scientists and engineers think they have the know-how to conquer the physical hazards of the journey to Mars. Open your eyes, please. The depths of the human mind pose another greater risk. Never before have human beings been so far removed from contact with family and loved ones back home. Because for the first time in the history of human spaceflight, they will lose sight of the Earth. When we're going to Mars, after a few days, Earth is just a smaller and smaller dot in your rearview mirror. And you are going to then have to have a whole new psychological uh, level that you are on. The only Mars analogy on Earth, Antarctica, is no match for the isolation of the Mars mission. Jean Lemire spent six months with his crew, isolated in Antarctica. For him, communication was a priority. I decided right from the beginning that the people were able to, uh, to have communication with their family at least once per day. Very expensive, but uh, very important. They have news from the people they love, and uh, it's important. The further the Mars craft is away from Earth, the longer the communications delay. Family communications bring cold comfort across the abyss of space. No technology known to science can beat the interplanetary time zone gap. We copy that you have an electrical power system of... The real-time video conferences of science fiction are all fiction, no science. Psychologists are grappling with the question, what will they say to the Mars astronauts should catastrophe strike at home? I know they videoed the service, so Bull's going to put it into the next batch transmission. The current thinking is that we ask, as a matter of informed consent, we would say to you, if you were going on a mission, if something happens, 
in this regard. Would you want to know, or would you want not to know? The key relationships in your life, you know, uh, you really miss them. Uh, my son was uh, a little over a year and a half years old. My wife was pregnant. An issue that comes up is, you know, what if something bad happens to your family on earth? Should they send you that message and tell you that you lost your son? You know, it'd be a, it'd be a tough time. I get choked up just thinking about it. If one of the astronauts has a breakdown, there's no nearby hospital to send him to. The rest of the crew has to deal with the problem. If a person truly starts to develop a physical condition that makes them dysfunctional or dangerous, then it becomes basically either a medical response in, in which the person has to be um, sedated or medicated, or it becomes a command and control response in which the mission commander restrains the person so that they cannot damage themselves or the crew or the vehicle. The only solution is to try and stop breakdowns before they start. Psychologists are a constant presence in Russian mission control, observing the behavior of the crew. The 2007 arrest of shuttle astronaut Lisa Nowak revealed the limits of any psychological assessment program. The astronauts go through a very detailed uh, psychiatric and psychological evaluation uh, at the time of selection. After those tests and interviews are done, they are reviewed by a panel of experts to make a recommendation to the selection board. And then finally, the psychologist panel uh, staffs all those cases for what we would call suitability for shorter, long duration flights. For the Mars mission, NASA is looking for new technology to prevent psychological meltdowns in space. David Dingus is a scientist specializing in facial analysis to detect stress. Video is fairly unobtrusive. That means that we ask the question, how could video help us understand whether humans are being stressed uh, in any context? And uh, that was the platform on which we developed the idea of trying to use something called computer vision to track facial expressions of humans to detect when they are stressed by their performance demands. Lift your eyebrows as high as you can. Okay, try to form an asymmetry in your mouth. We see this a lot from subjects. Uh, he has a hard time doing it. He's very symmetrical in his face. Commander Richard Irwin, psych assessment report, February 2nd. Specialized software examines facial movements, looking for telltale signs of emotional disturbance. Mission control could use this information to medicate and, if necessary, restrain a mentally unstable astronaut. So far, no knife fights. Um, here you can see Dr. Dimitri Metaxas helped develop the facial stress software for NASA. We're into the science of quantifying why people behave the way they behave and how they express behavior. It sounds surprising why people from different countries and different genders exhibit stress the same way, because not all types of emotions are expressed exactly the same way. But in this case, the brain works similarly when it comes to stress situations. NASA is a partner in the development of the stress detector technology, aiming to perfect it for the mission to Mars. Scientists in Russia share NASA's interest in facial analysis to identify stress. The person's facial expression shows the psychological type of the person and his ability to cooperate. There are people who complement each other, and there are people who oppose each other. The model based on the phenomenon of facial expression allows us to determine psychological types of personalities. Stress is one problem. Boredom is another. The real Mars spacecraft will be largely automated. Unlike the science fiction version, there is no hologram deck, no alien ships to shoot at. The reality is, there will be little to do for six months. There are some people who just are not psychologically suited for those periods of boredom. They would just go stark raving mad. Then, it all changes once they approach Mars. Psychologists fear the astronauts may not be ready for it. They may suffer from a syndrome known as attention tunneling. 
Often in heavily automated systems, you can go from prolonged periods of boredom to moments of intense performance demand very rapidly. And you want to train people to deal with those rapid transitions. 1979, Three Mile Island Nuclear Generating Station in Pennsylvania. A faulty gauge leads plant workers to make the wrong assumptions while the reactor core is in full meltdown. There has been a state of emergency declared on Three Mile Island. Please stay indoors with your windows closed. For five days, a nuclear fire rages out of control before engineers find the real cause of the problem. Three Mile Island became a case study for attention tunneling. An automated system flung a bored team into action. Under stress, they made several critical mistakes that nearly cost tens of thousands of lives. The Mars crew will have no margin of error. If one of them makes a mistake, they will all die. That's why we think for Mars the best thing is to have an automated uh, piloting and landing system with the crew only intervening if there's something goes wrong. Try to avoid all those potential complications. This raises a new question. How to train a crew to survive the psychological pressure of living with the constant fear of dying for a thousand days? The Russian space station Mir has had its share of mishaps. The worst was in 1997, and it is an important lesson for the crew that travels to Mars. Mir commander Vasily Sibilia was at the controls when an unmanned cargo supply ship slammed into Mir. The collision punched a hole in the station's module, exposing the astronauts to the deadly vacuum of space. It took two hours to contain the problem. The whole crew was within moments of evacuating the station in escape pods. One of the mere crewmen on that mission was so stressed, he had already decided to kill himself. One of the cosmonauts, actually, uh, Lazutkin, told me that on the 10th days, he decided to commit a suicide because he couldn't stand it already. He went to a remote place in one of the modules. And before suicide, he decided to sleep. The cosmonaut woke up and chose to live. On the journey to Mars, the fear of death will be a constant companion. <coughs> From liftoff to splashdown, there are many ways to die. They will need to find a new breed of astronaut with better coping skills and different personalities. And they will all have to pull together as a team unlike any other crew in history, their lives will depend on it. Sergei Volkov and Roman Romanenko, the cosmonauts chosen by Russia to go to Mars, must learn how to trust each other in a survival situation. We start together and we should finish together, maintaining the best possible psychological microclimate in the team. The Russians know only too well that Pairing the wrong crew members could lead to tragedy. In 1982, Russian cosmonaut Valentin Lebedev sent a message to Mission Control. If you don't bring us down to Earth now, I'm not going to work with this corpse anymore. After six months in space, Lebedev was prepared to kill his fellow cosmonaut. Russian Mission Control talked him out of what could have been the first murder in Earth orbit. On a mission to Mars, NASA could face the same challenge. Since 1999, NASA astronauts have trained at the National Outdoors Leadership School in Wyoming. Here, the exploration generation of astronauts will learn how to deal successfully with conflict. Expedition behavior is oftentimes wrapped up into a very positive personality, but positive expedition behavior also comes in the form of when people are willing to ask the hard questions. Cannon Gator's favorite example is the crew of STS-107, the seven people who would tragically die when the Columbia burned up in the Earth's atmosphere in 2003. Technical delays gave the astronauts two years to train together, longer than any other shuttle crew. 
In the Wyoming wilderness, they faced a problem. One crew member did not want to scale a mountain with the others. Then he changed his mind. He decided the good of the team was more important than his own desires. So basically, a group that's going to aggressively pursue the peak and a second group that's not so aggressive, aggressively going to pursue the peak. Uh, that's one option. The uh, other option is if we all just stay together as a group of seven and uh, do the best we can. You know, go for the peak. Here's a great example of positive expedition behavior shown by Mike Anderson, who said, I don't really want to climb, but for the team, I will. Cannon Gator and his team have identified four personality types that would be ideal for a journey to Mars. The driver, the analyst, the motivator, the relationship builder. And all of them have to be team players, no cowboys. And there's no room for duplication. On a trip to Mars, you're inevitably going to be faced with problems. If you've got the same thinkers, the same types of thinkers on the trip, uh, you're going to run into problems pretty quickly. The Russians are now ready to conduct a test on Earth to simulate the Mars mission. Six volunteers will be locked in a small capsule for at least 500 days. Oxygen and water will be recycled. There will even be a simulated Mars landing and communications with the mock mission control center. Of course, we're also looking at the possibility of nervous breakdown in the conditions of spaceflight. If someone snaps, the experiment can be canceled in a moment. There will be no such luxury in a spaceship, especially now as they face the most demanding and dangerous moment of their journey. About six months after leaving Earth, the exploration astronauts face the deadliest part of the entire mission, penetrating the Martian atmosphere and landing on the red planet. To get a probe onto the surface of Mars is very challenging. We're batting about 500, roughly speaking, about 50-50. Getting a human onto the surface won't be any less difficult. The crew has done everything they can to stay mentally and physically alert. They've trained and exercised, but they've also lived through radiation, weightlessness, and the psychological pressure cooker of isolation and confinement. And now, the moment of truth. You simply want to survive. Of course it is nerve-wracking to face the uncertainty, whether everything will function well, whether you will live. Going from Mars orbit to the surface has been called the six minutes of terror. On the surface, there will be no waiting rescue crew, no medical team. If you've got astronauts who are not in the peak of condition, then you may have an unsuccessful mission right at the very end where they need to be, you know, at their prime. To solve the psychological risks of the man Mars mission, some discoveries still need to be made on Earth. In 2006, NASA conducted an 18-day experiment in its undersea lab called NEMO. 15 meters long, just four meters across, Nemo is an underwater analogy for the Mars craft. For this mission, NASA installed cameras and microphones to observe stress levels in the crew. This data was fed to Mission Control for real-time observation. The computers are an early warning system for mental crisis, triggering treatment for a stressed out astronaut, or in the worst case scenario, restrainment. As the Nemo project pushes forward, NASA seeks crews which come equipped with their own problem-solving skills. Unlike Apollo 13, there will be no Houston to instantaneously deal with deadly problems. I'll get my turn in the driver's seat. NASA is also experimenting with artificial intelligence as companions for the mission to Mars. Continues to challenge Rick. Each astronaut might have a custom-designed AI companion to talk to when human interaction becomes too volatile. It's a start to keep astronauts distracted from the day-to-day -day rhythm of life in space. Finally, experts in both Russia and the United States are looking for ways to pinpoint the ultimate crew for the exploration generation. No adrenaline junkies, no space cowboys, only team players who respond well to structure and can think outside the box in moments of crisis. It's hard to say what awaits us on Mars if we go there. 
But this training is a way of developing skills to face any extreme conditions anywhere. Mission planners, ground control, and billions of people on Earth will wait anxiously to see if the first humans to travel to Mars will make it safely to the surface. 25 meters. Will they successfully push their way through the six minutes of terror, or will they perish Copy that. unseen, Picking up wind. millions of kilometers from home?